once called a scientist to ask them about downloading our brain, like, you know, slicing it up and downloading it into a computer. And he said to me, let me put it this way. I don't plan on dying in this body, on this planet, or in this century. Can you believe that? I was obviously taken aback, but this is not what's gonna happen, at least anytime soon. But I love his moxie. I mean, I'm not an expert. But based on the people I've talked to other than him, we got a long way to go before that. Immediately, I think what we want to do is tap our brain's potential. We're going to be keeping the life inside of our head for now, but we're going to be using that as kind of the CPU of whatever we want to do, whether that's plugging an arm into the brain or using the brain to power something else. Think Johnny Mnemonic or The Matrix, which actually brings me back to something I wondered, which is like, why does Keanu do all the weird brain movies? But you know, that's neither here nor there. How far off was this scientist? Can we read and write to the brain well enough that we could use it like Neo? Can we download the brain or at least use its processing power to do something else? Let's kick into it and find out. Hi, 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 Jellyheads. Trace here. This is episode four of five on upgrading our brains. We've already covered connecting to the brain and reading and writing to the brain. We've talked about how we get information out and how we read what's going on and mimic what's being put back in. And today we're talking about downloading, uploading and augmenting. We're talking about living inside of the machine. We're going to talk about roboticizing. I mean, within reason. We're still trying to ground it in reality here. I'm going to stay right at the top. We cannot download a brain. We cannot download your consciousness. We cannot take you and put you in a computer like the Matrix or Anton Zola or anything like that. But we can still do amazing things even in 2020. For example, we can convert the actual neuronal activity of your brain to sound. This is from a rat's brain. There are 21 action potentials in this one second clip. Now, a computer would read that information. They don't need it to be sound. They can do it without converting it to that called sonification, but they can read that. The computer has an algorithm that will smooth out all the noise and understand what the action potential is and what they want it to do based on where in the brain it's coming from and all sorts of other factors. The University of Connecticut, Yukon, had a bunch of people's brains that they EEG'd and the participants listened to notes played on a piano while getting their EEG read. And because they knew which sounds the participants were hearing, they used that data to convert the EEG signals into sound. Holy crap, right? Isn't that amazing? That is actual sound from the brain converted into audio that we recognize as music. And this is done via regression algorithms. A regression algorithm can pull the note back out from the neuronal activity. Regression is used in statistics and mathematics to get relationships between variables. So for example, you have lots of data and you wanna know something that's happening, you can use regression analyses. This is great for stuff like weather. Let's say we wanna know rainfall, but there's so much weather data out there, we can use regression to get just the rain fall percentages. Economics is another example, stock market behavior, GDP growth, and so on and so on. Anything with lots of data and we want to filter out something specific, regression analysis. Getting the musical note out of thousands of brain scans does the same things. And they do this by playing the same note with many, many EEG scans. The same note again and again. This meant middle C and that was A sharp or whatever. And we know that after lots and lots of data, more research is needed. We know the stimulus and we can find it within the data and we can take that and use it to make regular music. not super practical, but it's amazing. Speaking of practicality, prosthetics. BCIs are currently being used to try and give people who no longer have access to their limbs access to an alternative limb. This is Jan. She is eating a chocolate bar, which is amazing because Jan is a quadriplegic. She lost the use of all four of her limbs. 
quadriplegic. And this happened due to spinocerebellar degeneration. It's a rare genetic disease. In 1996, Jan had a completely normal life. She had children, a family, a job. But by 2003, she could no longer move from the neck down. It was a fast progression from tingling to complete loss of function. It's heartbreaking. But in 2011, she applied to a University of Pittsburgh study to try and get control of a robotic arm. They used an EEG to monitor her brain so they could determine where to put the electrode that they would have to implant directly on her brain tissue. Now that we know all about the EEGs and what they're looking for and the difference between that and the other BCIs, you probably know why they want to do that. They want faster speeds. They use that EEG and fMRI to find a good place for her implant. The EEG is a bit slower, but less invasive. We know this. And they used algorithms to filter out the noise from the rest of her brain, which we also talked about already. And it's getting better all the time. But participants are asked during these EEGs and fMRIs to imagine moving their hands and feet. Can you imagine moving your arm? Yeah, that's all you're doing. But your brain is mirroring what you're thinking about. If you see someone else moving their arm, your mirror neurons inside of your brain, your brain is literally moving inside of itself in the same way that you're watching someone else do it. When you imagine that you're moving your hand or even just watching me do it, inside of your brain, something is going just like this. Brain scans assume active areas are where they need to put their electrodes. So once they knew where to put the implants, they had to cut open her skull and implant two Utah electrode arrays directly onto her left motor cortex. The left motor cortex normally controls her right hand. Once the skull was closed up, they left a little hole for the wires to come out and then put caps on top that they could attach the computer to. Antibacterial gel was applied often because they didn't want a brain infection to get in through those holes. The plugs were quarter sized and they're on the outside of her head to connect to the computer. And she named the two plugs because this is just how Jan is, <laughs> Lewis and Clark. But the arrays, they're not measuring one neuron at a time. They're actually measuring the voltages of hundreds of neurons. So they have to use those algorithms again to guess where she wants her arm to go based on lots and lots of data. And it smooths out the signals and motions in real time. Too much regression, then Jan has no agency. She's barely thinking and the arm does all sorts of stuff. Too little regression and Jan will never learn. It's too hard to see the progress. It's like a video game or a flight simulator. You need to start easy you need to sandbox them and slowly give the player more control we record those voltages and we kind of regress them against where we think the person might want to move and based on some math that we happen to know exists in the brain we can you know linearly map this these voltages that we record from the electrodes to what we think the person's trying to do when they move over time with training the human brain can be taught to move mouse cursors, type on keyboards, push buttons, move arms, and guide wheelchairs. We can send those velocity commands to basically anything you want. You could send it to a blender if you wanted to, just push the power button. My current lab uses computer cursors, but you could also use any number of assistive devices. One big advance since Jan's time is back and forth communication. We can read and write to and from the arm. Maybe you remember this clip from earlier. At the time, that was still considered a little, if you pardon the pun, reaching. <laughs> but with a bit of bioengineering and a bit of psychology, this robot was able to sense touch. That guy could feel Obama fist bumping him. Isn't that crazy? And it sends those signals back into the brain and says, hey, you're being touched right now, here's how. It mimics action potential seen in other touches in other brains, and it puts it back in the same place. But it also helps that that person can see their hand because our brain relies on other senses too. Do you remember the touch series from a couple months back? The phantom hand illusion where you block your hand and you put a rubber hand on the table and you can go back and watch that. The regression works both ways. A prosthetic arm that is robotic, your brain takes it over. It owns that hand. It is my hand. The regression though works both ways. You have to regress output. You can't make it too easy or too hard to move the arm, but you also got to regress going back into the brain because you can't overwhelm the brain with input. It wouldn't know what's going on. You have to have agency over the hand, but you also want to make sure you're getting clear feedback. The funny thing is though, it doesn't have to be that clear. Your brain gets a weird fuzzy signal. It's like, I'm not really sure where that's coming from, but I see my thumb touching. So it kind of jumps the gun. So. 
those sorts of things kind of work to our advantage in that we don't know exactly, and electricity is not a very good um, specialized tool. It's kind of like, you felt something. What I think would be amazing is downloading things from your brain, like your dreams knowing my dream when I wake up and being able to kind of watch it back or know what it was about. That'd be amazing, right? I feel like I dream really amazing stuff and I'm, I'm like, oh my goodness, I can write a whole fantasy novel series about the things I dream about and then I forget. That's definitely achievable. I, 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 I've, I think from the study I saw, and it was a while ago, they weren't able to recreate very clear images, but they were able to get some kind of blurry image and i i just thought that was wild now i'm not exactly sure what liesel was talking about exactly we couldn't find the exact study and i'm no mind reader but i did find a kyoto university in japan study where they used fmri scans and it was the same as the brain music one where they knew the image and they knew the stimulus images and they used lots of fmri data and then they tried to get a computer program that would reconstruct the images from the stimulus they look like this so the researchers trained an algorithm with all these images. Then, using brain scans, just like the sound experiment, were able to pull this data out of people's brains. Eesh. A, bit, a bit messy, a bit messy, not the best. The letters though, super creepy, right? You kind of have to think of it like this. Imagine you're listening to your neighbor's radio through a brick wall, and it's not particularly loud. You're trying to guess what the song is and then sing it to your friend who's in the room. You're not gonna be able to hear the song very well and you have to record it and it's not really direct and it's not digital, it's definitely not clear, but it's a start and you have to then relate that song to someone else. That's essentially what this computer program has to do. And slowly, it's gonna get better at it if it has to do it all the time. More research is needed. Do I have to say it? I had to say it, yeah. We need more brains. The first time we started using Google, for example, to search the web, Google had no idea what we were gonna search for. It could guess, but then it ran 10 million searches and then 100 billion searches. And now it's like, oh, you're probably looking for sandwiches. I'm just gonna put that out there because I mean, to be honest, I'm looking for sandwiches like most of the time. We definitely need more data. Like data is the answer to everything at this point. <laughs> So aside from improved technology, we just need more data. That's why I try to get more people excited about this field so we can bring more people in. Um, and, and with the more researchers, researchers we have, the more participants we can have in our studies. And, and I think that would contribute so much to the knowledge base and we'll see an acceleration of these advances. Eventually, with enough data and enough research, we're gonna be able to put on a thing and it will tell us what our dreams were about. This is totally achievable. There's keywords and tags and guesses. I'm not saying you'll be able to watch it in 4K or something, but knowing what your brain was generally about might be achievable, might be real. Not tomorrow, maybe in like 100 years maybe 200 years, we'll be able to see pictures and learn from our past thoughts. But for now, this is already pretty incredible. And in all this future sci-fi, you know, I don't wanna get lost in the reality. So I'm gonna relate to you a bit about Jan's surgery. She needed those Utah arrays in order to control the arm, which by the way, she had named Hector. The four millimeter square metal arrays were injected right into her exposed brain tissue. I haven't been able to move my arm for 10 years. So just being able to physically move something else. I can't wait, this would be so cool. Jan was eventually able to use those electrodes to move two arms with that one left motor cortex. And again, she named the arms Hector and then the second arm, Lector. <laughs> she also participated in a DARPA study where she used her implants to fly a single engine Cessna and F-35 strike fighter in flight simulators. She'd never flown before. She did so only with her thoughts. Right now, the technology is the stuff of sci-fi. Jan, who has no access to her own limbs, had access to two arms and was able to fly a plane and able to feed herself chocolate, <laughs> which was her goal. What's a long nibble for a woman? <laughs> One giant bite for DCR. Are we gonna download a brain though? Not anytime soon. I love the moxie of that scientist from the beginning of this, but even if we can learn to simulate a brain in a computer and then simulate someone's brain before we actually download their real consciousness, 
We're talking about upgrades. And with this kind of technology, we're not there yet. Where we are is here. My name is Neil Harvison and I'm a cyborg. I'm not using technology, not wearing technology. I am technology. He's a cyborg. More on that next time. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Uno Dose of Trace about upgrading our brains. This was episode four of five. There's still one more left, all about cyborgs. It's coming on Wednesday. I really hope you come back and check it out. Make sure that you tell me down in the comments if you have ideas for future series or any of the thoughts that maybe came up inside of your little jelly brains while you were watching this video, because I had a lot of them. Thanks again for watching. I love you all. I am Trace, and I will see you in the future.